cards, always throw you off. Aloha, welcome to our monthly Human Rights Sustainability for March. This month we're focusing, of course, on International Women's Day, and it's quite important. It's also our 19th annual Women's Rights or Human Rights Conference. And today we're going to be looking at the important issues of equality, but also equity. So we're very fortunate to have with us today our guest speaker, who's the lecturer and also very importantly playing the role at the Iolani Peace Chair uh, this time here. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, what we'll be doing first and foremost is she'll begin and we'll have around a 45 minute presentation with some short videos as we usually do. And then we'll also focus on some other important issues here in Hawaii, as well as at the global level. So the issues we'll be looking at the global level is the UN Human Rights Council, but also the UN Commission on the Status of Women, and also looking at a couple of videos looking at climate change and how it impacts women and how women are disproportionately impacted due to the climate crisis that we face today. But first I'd like to introduce our speaker and thank you so much for coming. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thanks for having me. Um, it's amazing to be in Hawaii. Uh, for the first time. So I've been here for a week now, and I'll still be um, staying for another week. Um, and yes, well, my name is Fernanda Balata, and I work as a senior researcher and program manager at the New Economics Foundation in the UK, based in London. And I came here to, um, you know, to be the peace um, chair, uh, peace and social justice chair at the Center for the Iolani School. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Peter Greenhill, to Debbie Milliken, and to others at Iolani School for having me here. Um, and I came here to learn about what's happening in Hawaii um, around issues around sustainability, uh, in particular, you know, as an island um, um, state, islands, <laughs> states surrounded by the ocean. What does it mean to have a healthy coastal marine environment? What does it mean for jobs here, for local economic resilience? Um, how are young people engaging with those issues? So those are all the things that I'm interested in. Um, and I'm interested in that because for the past five, um, six years, I've been working at the New Economics Foundation on coastal and island um, economies. So we've done um, a big piece of work looking at coastal communities in the UK over the past years and how they are suffering um, slightly more from certain challenges than other communities um, in the UK, such as levels of deprivation are higher on the coast, um, educational underachievement, um, unemployment. Um, so there are a number of, of social and economic challenges that coastal communities are facing in the UK. Um, but there's a very strong narrative for coastal and island communities um, around sustainability that links to the ocean, because those are communities that are at the forefront of our relationship with the ocean. And since there is a, a great need also to solve all those challenges that the ocean and coastal um, environments are facing, you know, around overfishing and, you know, the, the, the fast pace of development on the coast, um, but then climate change and rising sea levels and what does that mean, you know, for all this infrastructure that we've put around our coastlines, um, what does it mean for um, people's well-being really living um, on the coast and, and, you know, the future of those places. And, um, you know, what we focus on, you know, on top of the research and then just understanding what's going on um, was about bringing people together um, to talk about those things and bringing people to the, together that are not talking to each other. Um, so, for example, people from different industries on the coast, so the tourism industry, the fishing industry, the energy industry, um, traditional industries on the coast, um, but also new sectors, new types of businesses that are um, also a part of that, those economies bringing public sector organizations and the local government agencies with local community groups because, you know, there's a lot going on really and there are a lot of good examples of things that are going on um, that are working towards that vision of delivering um, good, healthy, happy communities and a healthy environment. But why are they struggling? Why are they why are many of these groups um, and initiatives struggling to succeed and add up to transformative change, you know, to really address sustainability head on, which we've been talking about for so many decades. I um, mean, you know, we understand the challenges and recently we've seen reports coming out of, um, you know, around climate change um, at the end of last year. Um, we know what's going on in the political scene, um, you know, in terms of all the challenges of really countries in the U.S. and in the U.K. is the same. And I'm originally from Brazil and so I've been following Brazil politics as well, and we know these countries um, are very divided, you know, the, the people are, you know, um, 
uh, politically dislocated, people that have been politically dislocated, in communities that have been politically dislocated for a long time, um, they have been just voting and demanding change. <laughs> um, whatever that means. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity right now to really define what we mean by that change. What is the change we want? It's not just any kind of change. Um, and, you know, bringing people together that might feel like they are the different sides of that conversation to really understand what we have in common and actually that we're all trying to deliver the same things um, is what we care about. And so we've been doing that work in the UK. Um, you know, and just to give a brief background around NAF, and I'll show a little video to illustrate <laughs> what it is that I'm talking about. So it's, it's, a, it's a think tank. So traditionally think tanks, you know, sit down, they look at lots of data, you know, and evidence out there, and they um, do economic analysis around different topics, and then they put together reports and they try to talk to policymakers to um, um, get policy making to, to be done better. Um, but NAF is, so, so, we, so we are about big ideas, you know, coming up with big ideas, so really easy to identify what's wrong, what's happening there that's wrong, and what the barriers are, but what's the alternative then? You know, what are the solutions? Um, and we believe that the solutions are out there, as I was saying, you know, there are lots going on, and, and that's what we're interested in. So our research is really to find out what are people doing and how can we give more power um, and, and uh, put our resources at the service of those that are out there doing things. Um, so in terms of big ideas, we, um, you know, I've been focusing on coastal and island economies, but we do quite a lot of work, um, you know, on banking and finance reform. We do work on housing and land, you know, ownership. So who owns really land and who owns uh, resources and therefore who gets the power to do decision making. Um, and, our, and our big mission is to change, reform how we run the economy because all these things are connected to ultimately how we've been running the economy. Um, and a key part of that narrative is how we measure success of the economy and therefore how we, you know, what, what kind of um, projects we invest in, what kind of things we invest in is all dictated about what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. And for too long now, we've been measuring success on um, how much, um, you know, how, how we're using the planetary resources and labor and people to basically increase, you know, and, and deliver um, growth in the economy. So as measured by gross domestic project GDP. And we know that GDP is measuring um, everything that's happening is basically measuring economic activity. So that, that means that it's also measuring all this activity that it's causing environmental destruction, that it's causing um, social and economic inequality. So the little video I'll show you is just an idea, one of the many ideas that we've had over the years about how we could think differently about how we measure success in the economy and therefore in society. And what does that mean then if we start to measuring things different, differently? What does that mean for how we um, direct investment and how we use our resources. Everybody wants to live a good life and I presume we want people in the future to live good lives. We created the Happy Planet Index really to highlight the tension between creating good lives now and good lives in the future. Because we think people should be happy and the planet should be happy, why don't we create a measure of progress that shows that? And what we do is we say that the ultimate outcome of a nation is how successful is it at creating happy and healthy lives for its citizens. Economic activity tends to be taken as a sign of the sort of strength and power of a nation. And yet all it is is just economic turnover. What the Happy Planet Index does is it takes two things really. It's looking at the well-being of citizens in countries and then it's looking at how many resources they use. It creates what we would call an efficiency measure. It says how much well-being do you get for your resource use. It's like a miles per gallon, bang per buck indicator. Running horizontally along the graph is ecological footprint. How much pressure we put on the planet. More is bad. Running vertically upwards is a measure called happy life years. It's like a happiness adjusted life expectancy. And the yellow dot there you see is the global average. The challenge really is to pull the global average up here. That's what we need to do. And if we're going to do that, we need to pull countries from the bottom and we need to pull countries from the right of the graph. And then we're starting to create a happy planet. 
you can download the report, you can check out your own personal HPI score. It's the first global index of sustainable well-being. So that's one good video, and it's, it's something that we've also talked about here in Hawaii. I know I see one of the students and activists. And the deal is so good uh, in many ways. Um, but what we're looking at is another deal, a deal in a way like the Aloha Index. So in, in our class that we had on Global Futures last semester, we looked at the issue of what would the Aloha Index be? How would we measure living well in Hawaii? And it was interesting because it, it was more of how much time you actually have with your family, how much time you actually get to enjoy nature, how much time you're able to, you know, it's just a whole lot of different measurements of how students talked about the good life and what that means. So I know it's a good time that if there's anyone then in Hilo or Anthony, if you want to talk at West Oahu, we could uh, maybe look at how this global happy planet index fits in with some of the things that we look at or some of the ideas we also have here and how things are going on the neighbor islands. OK, there we go, Hilo. Uh, yeah, hi there, Joshua. How are you? Uh, the Hello, the good one to question see you. that good to see you too. Uh, we're kind of concerned over here. At least I'm concerned that our uh, our Micronesian communities, of course, uh, are mostly poor and living in public housing. And public housing and traditional ways of looking at housing for islanders is very different. So people get in trouble and sometimes lose their housing because when some of their relatives come. They have a hard time, you know, just saying you can't stay with us because the rules won't allow it. Is there any cons any plan or any pathway for people who are used to having large family gatherings to to get housing without so many restrictions? I think that's a good question. I think it's also something that uh, Fernanda talks about that we also have to. There's so much more to the equation when we're looking at the issue of the human right to housing and looking at these important issues of equity is that culture plays a giant role in that. And I know in a lot of the work that she's doing, and she even said when she came here, it's to listen, she really does have a good approach of listen, learn, and lead, in that she listens to the people, see what's going on, and then identifies what's going on in other places. But I'll let her definitely answer that aspect. And if anyone else has another campus also wanted to, you just hit the mic and we'll then you can take two questions. If not, we'll just go. You want to go? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with um, the issue here that you're describing. Um, and I think, um, is, it, is, is it like rules by um, the kind of agencies. public provision yeah, yeah. that you can't have parties? Is that what I'm well, there's, no. there's different aspects okay. in the sense of uh, we have a lot of rules if you get federal assistance. Mm -hmm how you use that assistance and right. where, and there's certain rules that like certain people can't stay, that your house is for you and shouldn't have someone who had a former felony. Or there's a lot of different mm -hmm. rules yes. that apply to when you move into public housing, yeah. is I believe what he's talking about there. And yeah. Marshall Islanders, we have a lot, but it's, it's, it's the issue of, because we also did nuclear testing, which was also uh, last week, Friday, was March 1st, Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific, and that was created to honor the people of the Marshall Islands, Micronesia had to endure the 67 mm -hmm. above uh, atmospheric tests that the U.S. did in the region. So many move here to also get health care because of the high rates of cancer and, and other aspects as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a specific example. But I think it applies to a lot of things that you look at in Scotland and the situation that you're finding in the coastal communities where the people always get austerity measures but are trying to make things work within a framework mm -hmm. that doesn't fit them, but is put on them and sort of yeah. hoisted. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, without understanding, obviously, fully what's what's going on here, but it sounds to me like, you know, it, it, it is that issue. Like, we, we're trying to focus on really the underlying causes of, of um, you know, a situation where people don't have um, the right to a distant, distant home, and then they have to accept or almost like take handouts. <laughs> You know, and, and it comes with all these restrictions, um, which sound to me quite quite crazy and and um, not fair, basically. So I think 
you know, I would I would tap into the kind of the angles like social justice and you know fairness in society of how we implement different things. And you know, the, on one hand, what you're talking about it's probably a symptom of you know the fact that resources and power is concentrated in such small um, hands. You know, few people own of that, and then all the rest of us has to kind of like you know, fight for, for what's left. And some people really at the far end of that have to just take whatever it's given. And that doesn't sound like a nice society to live in. And so how do you address the kind of underlying causes? How do you give people, you know, the right to education, to health, to housing, you know, as homes, as a human, like in London, and, and actually around, in coastal communities around the UK, you have, you know, a, a issue around second home ownership, for example. And people that live in those communities that have been moved out of, of places that are prominent within the town, you know, for tourism, etc., because people who don't live there just own those properties and they rather leave them empty, as it happens in London as well. They rather leave them empty, um, and you know, who, you know, who, who, who's, who's making those decisions? Why are we allowing that that to happen? Um, and so there is the, there are the underlying um, conditions for that, which is the kind of long-term change, you know, investment in the things that actually matter in society. And it links back to what I was saying about the way we've been running the economy and has meant that we invest very little on what matters and a lot on what doesn't. You know, jobs that are not really being producing any good to society, um, you know, uh, investing in, in uh, um, uh, um, finance um, industry, you know, that it's really just in the business of generating more, you know, money for what, you know, if, if not to invest in people's capabilities, you know, in the capabilities of places to run, you know, and give people decent lives. Um, and then on the other hand, there is the cultural and like how we then sort out the process by which we, we have those conversations, you know. And it feels to me that, again, now going back to, to Brazil, where I came from, um, it's really sad to see how sometimes the middle class, you know, or, or the rich class is like fighting with the poorer classes rather than us all understanding that we all kind of, you know, the, the, it's a different enemy, you know, like that's not, that's not really what it's about. And I think what, you, what you're talking about, um, you know, in neighborhoods and people coming into neighborhoods and maybe not being perceived as, you know, belonging or having the, the same kind of rights, um, I think that's a symptom, really, of, of all the bigger issues with how we are just gearing, the, you know, driving development in the first place. I think it's good, and we'll definitely hear, we'll have Jason. Hi, uh, I'm Jason on Oahu. Um, Hilo, can you hear there? Yep, perfect. Go, Jason. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the idea of... Uh, uh, Happy, or Global Happiness Index, World Happiness Index, it's a uh, great idea. Um, I'm kind of curious how, like, where you plan on taking that? Like, how will you convince decision makers to adopt that way of viewing the world when GDP is such an ingrained way of measuring the economy? I mean, it's great when you have a country like Bhutan that already kind of takes that into mm -hmm. consideration with growth national happiness, but how do you, yeah for the rest of the world? Like, where do you go from here? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, like I said, it's very, very easy to first <laughs> talk about the problem or the barriers are harder to come up with solution alternatives. But once you do, how do we implement them, right? And how do we fight, you know, the system that it's so ingrained already? Um, so I think, you know, from my you know, experience in the past few years working in the UK, at the UK level, and I think it's happening globally. I mean, you can see that there is already, you know, there has been progress in terms of how politicians and governments talk about these things. Um, so you've seen, for example, in the UK, um, in terms, that instead of talking about uh, growth-led development, they talk about inclusive growth, you know, and then now it's, you know, some of the local authorities, for example, are starting to get some measurements alongside GVA, which is the kind of local gross value added, so the kind of the local level GDP um, of an area. They are starting to um, put other measures alongside that, so like in particular like around health, um, and starting to measure like levels of inequality. So okay, we've grown the economy locally, but have certain areas that 
you know, where there is more deprivation, have they been lifted, you know, and, and how is it being distributed, basically. So that's already happening, you know, and that's just in the last, you know, few years, decades, um, decades, sorry, that I think there has been progress already in the, in the narrative around it. So people understand, governments understand, and they're talking about these things. I mean, talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, right, with the UN. So there is that acknowledgement, but there is still a bigger fight there in really the growth um, led development model um, in that, okay, now areas, local areas are doing it because there is the narrative set by government, but ultimately the, val the, the decision making is still happening around that kind of growth led model. Um, and now I think it's that opportunity that's opened up for that bigger discussion. I think how we do that is we, we, we talk, more, we are more honest about that. We're more honest that like, that's what we need to change. It's not gonna change tomorrow, but we need to start talking about that right now. Um, I don't see, I, I'm not having those conversations with politicians at that level yet. Um, I, I, I talk about these things and so do others, um, but that's not where they're at yet. But I think that's why I'm more interested in not just talking to politicians that have already you know, so many constraints and sometimes just don't have the vision or the leadership to take those things. Not bold enough or not taking risks. Um, but actually, let's plug in a woman since we're talking about International Women's Day. Um, and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in America, obviously leading a movement to challenge exactly that kind of growth led development because that's what the Green New Deal in America, it's really in essence about, you know? Um, so I think it's happening. So we need to start identifying, you know, where it's happening, how it's happening. It's been happening in kind of piecemeal things. Um, and we just need to have more of those conversations. We need to try and identify the leaders and the ones that have more of a decision-making power that, you know, we can, we can put more of our resources on, we can vote <laughs> for or whatever it is. Um, and that's how we're gonna make it happen. I honestly think that that's gonna happen. You know, it might not happen in the next decade. I hope it does because, you know, we all know that we need to change things very, very fast. Um, but I, I am convinced now, especially in light of the last few months and what's been happening around the world, that it's going to happen. It's not going to happen tomorrow. We're still going to feel quite a lot of <laughs> things going wrong for a while. I mean, Brexit is happening at the end of this month. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen in the UK and in Europe? But it's happening and so I really encourage everyone to like be bold and like not be shy of talking about those issues because we're all facing that same barrier ultimately. So. We just had the Global Issues Network meeting and that was uh, rounded out yesterday in the morning and one of my favorite comments was as they were introducing the tables they said we might not solve your issue that you raised today and it was like yep it's a Sunday probably we're not solve homelessness in Hawaii and poverty and a couple others. But I, you got to love the youth for We're going to do it right now. And so that was a, a good meeting where youth are coming together to talk about what's important. But I think we do have to really come up and challenge. And I think the good news is it's putting the ideas on the table. So AOC doing the Green New Deal, NEF doing the Blue New Deal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's based on a of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, where he looked a lot at economic, social, and cultural rights and was understanding that it's not only freedom of speech and freedom of worship, but freedom from fear and freedom from want and making sure that people have all the necessities they need to have a life worth living. And I think it's, it's redefining well-being in the world. So I think it touches upon some of those points. And definitely Bhutan with the gross national happiness. It's good that they're at the UN talking about GNH. I think it'd be exciting if we also came up with like a LOHA index. And of course we can make it an acronym for what each A-L-O-H-A -A stands for. But I know actually when I was in future studies, that was one of my assignments I did uh, for Professor Dater was how do we measure well-being? And then we also look at in our class because if you do talk to any student and any student does everything they're supposed to do, when they graduate, and they apply for whichever job, and they've scored the highest marks, they've studied, and they're supposed to just get the job. The job rarely matches what you would need to live in Hawaii. There's a huge gap, and it's not their fault. They didn't fail. They did everything right. And so it's looking at that. And I think the point you brought up is really good because a lot of cities are looking at that. Uh, 
Berlin, for one, at the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Berlin actually looked at taking housing out of the market because it was ruining the neighborhoods. And Barcelona, of course, also looked at this. And their new mayor was very much a campaigning green activist before she got in. And her campaign was Barcelona for Barcelonans. Because when you get there to Barcelona, neighborhoods would be gutted because people would buy to be in the cool neighborhood, but then there wouldn't be any neighborhood left. So she really focused on that. And I was there for one Christmas festival. And it was just astounding because it was in Plaza de Catalonia, right in the middle, where it's the economic hub. It's where everybody would want to stay, right at the top of La Rambla. But the whole market, Christmas market, was nothing but NGOs. And so you're giving that space to NGOs. And it was also a green festival in the sense that it was nothing to use any power except for what you generate. So the kids were on bicycles. They had, but everybody's having a great time. It's like this family gathering in the main spot. The closest thing we have is Honolulu Lights, but it doesn't have that social justice element to it. But the whole point of their festival was we can reimagine our city. And this is one example of even Christmas doesn't have to just be consumption. It can be time with your family. And they had all these creative artists and everything going on. You just sat in the square like all day going, this is great. You know, we still were to do that, I think, in Kapiolani Park, but it was, it was right there. So it's good to sometimes see and compare. So as you're traveling, you get to then look at some of the best models. Yeah, and there's a lot of different models. So in essence, we're already disrupting the system in different ways. I go back to my first point right at the beginning when I started talking is that those things are happening in isolation here and there, and they're working, but they're not connected, and so they're not adding up to the transformation that would then lead leaders to say, oh, okay, maybe we shouldn't just be measuring GDP to say, see whether or not we've been successful because all these things that matter to people, you know, they're doing things differently, so that's what we should be looking at. Um, because ultimately politicians will respond, you know, in democratic societies, you know, they respond to the electorate, you know, and so forth. So I really, what I want to see more of is all of us who have a little bit of resources here and there, be it with, you know, because we can speak <laughs> to people somewhere or, you know, because you have an organization, you know, any kind of level of power that we have that we actually direct that to those that are trying to do and that are struggling or just, you know, link up with others like us, you know, because I think, in, in, you know, and I, I, I won't be able to give an example, you know, for, for each one of you, but I encourage you to think about, like, how much is happening out there that um, people are trying to deliver change and so they think they have to talk to certain people and that they have to make certain connections, you know, and that's the only way. And normally this way of doing things you know, and not that you shouldn't do that bit, right? So we still talk to the politicians, but that way of doing things has got us into like decades of like charity, philanthropy, and you know, and, and things that have, of course, helped and have been done with really good intentions, but that ultimately haven't really changed, you know, what's been creating the problems in the first place. And so it's almost like we have to keep doing it. But now it's kind of that urgency because it's the you know, complexity of the issues around, you know, the climate, and you know the inequality that it's you know in the in the cultural shift that that creates because living in the UK like going there about 13 years ago coming from Brazil that it's I was raised in you know, deep inequality um, getting to the UK and uh, in the past decade the amount of people going to food banks has increased you know the decrease of uh, of public services I mean the amount of public spending um, has decreased you know and that, that's just in the past decade. And of course, it hasn't completely altered the culture in the country because you know the UK is you know has really strong institutions that have been built over you know a long time. Mm -hmm. But you're going to start to see crime levels are going to rise, you know, and all those things. And then all of a sudden, you know, the culture of a place, you know, and those institutions have have changed, you know, and and that's a lot harder to tackle. And I go back to um, the question around you know, that links more to the cultural, you know, and how people perceive each other, you know, and, and what kind of rights we give to people, you know, all those things, once they change, you know, and we lose that, um, that essence of what's right, you know, and how we take care of each other, it's really hard to, to bring it back again. So, yeah, it's, I, I believe that it's really important to um, keep doing things at a local level and what you can do, but without losing sight of what we're actually trying to change. 
Uh, thank you so much. I'm Ari here in Oahu. Um, I'm wondering if you tell us more about the data from the World Happiness uh, Index and reports. And it, are there certain things that can be done that will uh, that will impact that score the the highest? Uh, and and have you have you looked at localized uh, scores? Like, are people uh, happier on in coastal communities? Or like, it, what what are what are some of those data points that that policymakers can can really point to? So the Happy Planet Index is one I use because it's a great illustration of, you know, NAF trying to have a bold idea at the, the, the core of the question. But um, I would encourage you to check uh, Nick Marks. He's been leading that work. He no longer works with NAF, but he's a, a NAF fellow, as we call it. Um, people that have gone out and set up just that, like, so he's, he continues to do work around the Happy Planet Index. Um, and the Happy Planet Index, as it was done a few years ago, it was looking at well-being data uh, from places and things like life satisfaction um, and um, life expectancy and then um, carbon um, footprint um, and things like that. But, you know, it's, so it's, it's to create that illustration. I mean, certainly more work could be done. And if it was to be implemented by governments, you know, you can, you know, governments have a, a whole... Um, range of kind of data and different things that they can be measuring in society. Not all countries measure well-being, for example. I mean, the UK, it's recent in the last decade that we started measuring well-being levels. Um, but I think a key thing, certainly around the social justice element, if we, if we were to like, you know, evolve the Happy Planet Index a little bit more, would be to look at distribution. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the distribution of economic benefits within areas, especially like at a local level. I'd be very interested. We haven't done that yet. Um, things sometimes are led by, you know, how much funding you can get to do so much work. Um, but the idea is out there, you know, and local authorities can take that on board. And some places in the UK have started to, to look a little bit more at that. Um, so. I think two things that build on that is, one, we can look at the global goals, and in that process, countries actually have to then show up and do a voluntary national review and say how they're doing. One exciting thing as well, since the Human Rights Council is in session, is they've actually made the September session focusing on the SDGs and brings the Economic and Social Council there. So it's also not just this voluntary national review, but then when countries appear for any of the nine human rights treaty bodies, they also ask questions about the 17 goals. So they're trying to use all the mechanisms that exist at the same time to put pressure. Also, there's a forum on business and human rights that meets in November, and they're also trying to take the goals as a different measurement. So it's just trying to shift things a little bit. And then if we look at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's coming out as well with nationally determined contributions. So that'll be something that countries have to produce every five years. But I think the urgency is a big issue in the sense that if you look at the IPCC report and what was introduced in Katowice, we have a 12-year deadline. So what can we do and how do we do it and what are the big ideas? But then also what can we do at the local level? And I think one local level, and I don't know if people are familiar with it enough, but it was New Zealand. Uh, their new prime minister, Yacinda, younger woman, not even 40 yet, she said we're going to start measuring children's well-being. And that's their new way of saying how they're doing as a country. So. She launched that at the UN General Assembly, and I don't use LinkedIn that much, but actually I, I was on it last week, and she had her whole 15-minute speech about how they're rolling out the children's well-being on LinkedIn. And I was like, that's innovative, you know, to see that. So New Zealand looking at well-being and children's well-being, and she goes, that's how we're going to see if we're successful, depending on how our children are growing up. And of course, that's influenced because she's only the second woman head of state to have a child while in office. And she was the first one to take her baby to the General Assembly in September. So, you know, it's, it's good that she's, you know, walking the talk. But I think that's another way, at least as with New Zealand, then it's not, you know, we're trying it just small communities, but that's, you know, a pretty good sized country, even though John Oliver says they can't be found on certain maps. <laughs> it's uh, good that it's getting out there as a, another model that we can look at. Yeah, and I like that you brought the, sorry, just to add, um, because, you know, we, we do have, lots of initiatives out there, and the UN Development Goals is one of them, that 
you know, would provide a framework that all, it is providing a framework that all countries can measure the same things, right, so that we can have that kind of global level. I mean, I would encourage local areas to start measuring things differently to begin with, you know, like just to have the conversation at a local level. Maybe, you know, they still need to hit some targets, you know, for the national um, thing, but if they can start to engage the communities at a local level, like, look, we had to do this assessment for, you know, because we were required, but we also did this assessment here, you know, just so the community knows how we're doing all these other things, you know, and the framework uh, from the Sustainable Development Goals. So building on what we already have and what's already happening there. Um, just to say as well that we've done, NAF has done, um, after the Happy Planet Index, most recently a five headline indicators report, so you can look for that as well on our website. Um, and the idea of that was specifically to your question before, um, I forget your name, um, Jason, um, on how you engage politicians in that conversation. And we launched that report um, a couple of years ago with, uh, you know, some politicians, you know, in the UK, um, you know, and some journalists looking around that because the idea for, for governments is that they want something simplified Right, as simplified as possible and hence, you know, just focus on DDP. Oh, that's just one way, you know, like just, just go with that figure. Um, so the five headline indicators were trying to just pick up some pillars around like, you know, education, health, um, environment, etc., just to sit alongside that kind of economic uh, measure um, as a way to say, well, it, it could still be something not, you know, crazy. It could still be kind of like headlines, um, but at least expanding a bit beyond just the economic focus. Are there any more questions from Hilo? Or just to make sure everybody yes. in the neighborhoods can be included? There you go. Uh, I, I want to appreciate the, that you brought up the SDG uh, logo there. It reminded me that this is the, is this not the month for the review? And there, uh, how do we participate in the uh, voluntary review for the United States? Is that this month? Well, no, no, the, the review won't be this month. Uh, what will happen uh, this month is there's the Human Rights Committee will start its process to review the United States on civil and political rights. They'll start the list of issues prior to reporting on March 14th in Geneva under the UN Human Rights Committee. But um, Ari was at an event at the Global Engagement Summit of UNA, because I know many of you are also UNA members on Neighbor Island. And at that meeting, they also had a UPR workshop. And so each local chapter is looking at doing a UPR workshop, a universal periodic review, and that one's broad. The exciting thing is you can take anything from the UN Charter, anything in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has civil, political, economic, social, cultural, anything the U.S. has ratified, anything a special rapporteur has said. So Fernando brought up as well the special rapporteur in extreme poverty, Philip Alston. He went to the United States last year, and he was also in the United Kingdom. So his visits are a way of also measuring how a country is doing from a human rights perspective. And so the UPR, we can all work on that and turn those in by September. So, you know, in Hilo, if you want to coordinate, we can mobilize together and try to do one in Hilo, one on Kauai, one on Maui, and have a UPR. And also this summer with Pacific Asian Affairs Council, since Jason's in the room, we're going to try to focus our, our summer course, June 24th to 28th, looking at doing the voluntary local review, a VLR, to making sure the youth participate and write that, and then be able to share that one month later in July at the high-level political forum in New York. So nothing directly this month. It's the beginning process of a handful of things, but exciting opportunities. But let me hand it back to Fernanda so she could talk about anything else she wants to for the next five minutes, and then I know she has to head back to Iolani campus but really glad that she would be able to come up and participate, and thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'll just finish with um, two things. Um, obviously, I came here to speak to a lot of young people um, in Oahu, uh, well, in Honolulu, and um, I've been amazed by like how kids just ask the right questions <laughs> if they're given a chance. Um, and I think my main message to them, you know, what I want to see more of is just, you know, young people asking que those questions, you know, and challenging us and challenging themselves. Um, but I think that young voice 
is, you know, obviously of extreme relevance now with Greta Thunberg in Sweden, you know, being um, an amazing 16-year-old that has gained, like, global traction um, just by doing something that she felt was right, um, you know, and all of a sudden everyone is talking about her um, and she's passionate about, uh, obviously, climate change. Um, but like I mentioned before, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in America, you know, she's a 29-year-old woman and um, who was not afraid to get there and actually take the risk as a pro political career um, to just defend something she believed in. And it's very much about supporting the voices of young people in America because the Green New Deal in America, you know, now has been brought by a young um, people's movement, which is amazing. It is the right way of doing things. You know, it's really so society and different parts of society, you know, different ages within society engaging the process and identifying how they can work together, you know. How can a movement of young people can then link to someone who has a political voice, um, you know, finally and, and, and bring that out. And it doesn't really matter what you think about it or where it's going to go. The important thing is that it's out there and we're talking about it. You know, and it's opened up that conversation to, to make, to talk about those difficult things. Um, I'll just plug in as well that recently um, my dad showed me a video about a, a young girl in Brazil. Um, so, uh, sorry, young woman <laughs> in Brazil. She's 25 years old and she got elected last year um, um, for Congress as well to represent um, her country. And, you know, in light of everyone else that's sitting around her, <laughs> probably in that Congress, you know, she stood up and she gave a very eloquent speech about what, you know, um, what it would mean to have education reform in Brazil. She's passionate about education. So, you know, just to plug into people like young and old, I mean, really, you know, like we are all passionate about different things, but, you know, it is us all pursuing those things and, and trying to connect um, to their wider movement that we, we are going to be able to deliver those things. We don't, each one of us do, don't have to do all of it, you know, and, and we just need to be better at talking to each other and going out of our ways um, to actually identifying those people that we should be aligning with. And it might be that you care about education, someone else cares about health. I mean, obviously we all care about both, but you know, you, you're fighting for your thing, but you know, try to build those bridges around it. Don't just talk to the people you're used to or the people that you think you should be talking to. Um, I think that's very important. And in, in light of talking about time and how we use our time and how we, um, what we are able to do or not able to do, I just wanted to finish with a video because we've been doing quite a lot of work on a shorter working week, which tends to be a big challenge in society to deliver many things because we're all overworked. We're all <laughs> extremely tired and overwhelmed with information. So that's another one of the big ideas that have been out there, not just by NAF, by others. And it's something that has been, we've been talking about for a number of years. And finally, it's the right timing and it's picking up momentum and businesses are doing and governments are doing it. So the power of actually having ideas, pursuing them and not being afraid to be that voice, you know, amongst a lot of people that are saying, really, you're crazy. Because in a few years' time, once we really have to address that challenge, because it's normally just people that are trying to like not address things that would say that, once we really have to address, you've had that idea, that idea's out there, you know, and, and we're talking about it, and we have something to work with. Is that okay? okay. It is. Unless there's one last, any last point by any of the amazing women there in Hilo? <laughs> or you could talk to Fernanda directly before she has to leave. And if not, we'll go straight to the video. Just wanted to give you that one last opportunity. No, I don't have a question. I'm learning. Okay. No <laughs> problem at all. Just wanted to give you that opportunity. So we'll show the video then, and we'd also like to thank Fernanda for coming. Mahalo so much. Mahalo for having me. Okay. <laughs> Here's our video, and then we'll continue right afterwards. Think about this. How much have you bought that you don't need to fit in with people you don't like? How often More volume, please. Sleep deprived and overworked. John Maynard Keynes predicted that by 2030, we would be working just 15 hours a week. He said that the Western standard of living would have multiplied at least four times since 1930. And he was right about some of it. Places like the UK and the US are five times richer than they were 100 years ago. But despite this, our work is consuming more of our lives than ever. Too much work isn't just bad for those putting in the hours. Overtime can be deadly. From Chernobyl to the Space Shuttle Challenger, 
overworked managers often have a role to play in disasters. It's no coincidence that the financial sector, which triggered the <coughs> biggest disaster of the past decade, is absolutely groaning with people doing overtime. And countries with the biggest disparities in wealth are precisely those with the longest working weeks. The poor are working longer hours just to get by, and the rich are finding it ever more expensive to take their time off as their hourly rates rise. Nowadays, excessive work and pressure are status symbols. Time to oneself is equated with unemployment and laziness, rather than sensibly putting life above work. Now, I can hear the wonder. Won't we just be glued to the TV all the time if we're not at work? Actually, it's precisely in overworked countries like England and the US that people watch an absurd amount of TV. Up to four hours a day in England, which adds up to nine years over a lifetime. And if you're worried about wasting time, just think about this. 37% of British workers think they have bullshit jobs. And that's just those who are aware of it. It's like Jeffrey Hammerbecher, a former maths whiz working at Facebook, lamented a few years ago. The best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. If we cut out bullshit jobs, give everyone a basic income, and kept useful vocations like care workers, garbage men, teachers, cleaners, and scientists, we could reclaim so many hours and change the way we live. I feel too busy. So how can we get out of this busyness trap? Yeah, I get it. You're too busy. Everyone's too busy. Actually, you're probably thinking right now that you're too busy to watch a short video about being too busy. <laughs> All right, so that's a short one there. But looking at the 15-hour work week, and one thing I thought we could look at, and that's, that was the focus was really well connected to exactly what Fernanda said, is I found two videos of youth that really focused during the recent visits of Congress people back home. So most people know that our Congress people come home usually once a month, and they stay there for a week. Otherwise, they usually come home on the weekends, and they work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But uh, in this case, we have one group finding Senator Feinstein in California, and also another one trying to find uh, Senator Mitch McConnell. Uh, Mitch McConnell's eluding them a little bit more. Feinstein meets with them, but it's still shocking with how she talks to the young people a little bit. So I think we could watch these two uh, videos quickly, and then it gives us some other things to talk about. But it builds exactly on what Fernanda was saying about getting young people involved and included and to make sure that their ideas are heard. So we're here asking you see the Saturday to vote Night yes Live version of this. Oh, did you? Because that is the only <laughs> that resolution that will not pass the Senate. And you can take that back to whoever sent you here. Who else here is afraid? Me. Me. I think Working. actually like if you search it up there is something called like climate anxiety now. People in our generation are genuinely like having like mental illnesses. I feel scared mm. because if we don't fix this it is literally going to be an apocalypse. Well, youth versus Apocalypse is a youth-run climate justice organization. We've done protests, we've done rallies, we've reached out to different politicians. I was prepared to be disappointed. We are trying to ask you to vote yes on the Green New Deal. Well, there are reasons why I can't, because there's no way to pay for it. Yes, there is. Well, yes, there we have is. tons of money going to the military. Half of all, a lot of ours is going to the military. You're supposed to listen to us. That's your, How old are your you job. How old I'm 16. Are you? I can't well, you didn't vote. vote for me. Well, she, I am disappointed that she didn't see that she was looking at the faces of the people who were going to be impacted in the future. Now is the time and that it's my time. It's my generation's time to take a stand and to be the ones who are putting forth the action and the change. We really need you guys to understand how important this is, because even if you're not here, it's going to be your kids that are here, and it's going to be the legacy you leave behind. Depending on what you do right now, that's how we're going to remember you, and that's how future generations are going to remember you, as the generation who either did something and backed us up, or as the generation who left us in the dust. So a short, a short one, but a really good one to look at that. And if we um, look at another one, it's actually a little bit longer. We won't watch the entire thing. But this is them after they tried to find Mitch McConnell in his district. 
us right now. Um, we have a bunch of Kentuckians behind us. Uh, we're here to demand that Mitch McConnell look us in the eyes and tell us that the $1.9 million that he's gotten from fossil fuel CEOs is more important than my generation's future. Um, this whole week, we of Kentuckians have been trying to find McConnell. We went to his office in Frankfurt and Louisville on Tuesday and were turned away from him. We went again on Wednesday and sat in the rain until sunset. We camped outside of his office on Thursday and with no response from him. So we came out here. We came out here to share our stories and to show him that Kentucky needs a Green New Deal, that we need the Green New Deal to ensure that we have clean water, clean air, safe jobs, stable jobs in Kentucky, and that this is the only solution that we have for a livable future in Kentucky and also throughout the, throughout the world. We're here to show Mitch McConnell that his own constituents support the Green New Deal. Not only do 81% of Americans support the Green New Deal, not only is it, um, has bipartisan support, but his own constituents are pushing him to sign on to co-sponsor the Green New Deal. We're here to call him out for his shameless ploy to rush the vote of the Green New Deal that he's just trying to crush our momentum and do the bidding of fossil fuel industries, that he's not listening to us, that he's been ignoring us for years, that he's never acted on climate change, that he's never done anything to support my generation, to support the youth, his constituents. We're here to call him out for all of his corruption and everything that he's done to hurt our generation and to show him that when he comes up for election in 2020, he will not be getting the vote of young people. Because we know that in this moment, he chose to stand with fossil fuel CEOs. He chose to stand with rich millionaires, billionaires that are lining his pockets instead of us, instead of the Kentuckians that he's supposed to be representing. Um, so we have another young Kentuckian here with me. Um, Ollie Terry, who's going to share a little bit of her story of why she's here supporting the Green New Deal. Philippines, um, where their city, Davao, is threatened by rising sea levels and uh, tropical storms that are getting worse and worse because of climate change. And um, they are disabled. My mother is, able to un is not able to stand up on her own, and so I'm terrified that if a storm or a flood were to come through, I would lose my mother, I would lose my father. Um, and so uh, I'm here fighting for them. Um, because the effects, those actions that America takes spread globally. We all breathe the same air. Um, you know, just because they're in the Philippines now does not mean that they're any different from Kentuckians, from Americans. You know, um, we drink the same water as them, uh, and you know, the effects that we have here, just they just spread globally. And so, um, if we, uh, Americans, uh, we need to take responsibility to protect other people too, you know. Um, they help save lives in America, uh, in Kentucky, and uh, we have an obligation as a nation to protect them too. And so we have a responsibility, an obligation to adopt the Green New Deal um, because uh, we need to, you know, protect these other people too. And uh, the people like Mitch McConnell do not understand that. They, um, Mitch McConnell and his billionaire friends, all they care about is their money. I'm here today 
to demand that Mitch McConnell look me in the eyes and tell me that the $1.9 million he's taken from fossil fuel companies is more important than my generation's future, than my grandfather and my mother's lives in the Philippines, than the lives of the people in Kentucky who are fighting every day against the uh, struggles of climate change. Right, so as you can see, that's an hour and 50 minutes. We are not going to follow them through the entire process. But it was exciting to see the youth using, in many ways, uh, social media. Uh, here, they, you can see it right here. They're actually in his office doing a sit-in. So they, they actually enter the room. Generation in our state. We are here demanding that Senator McConnell tell us the truth, that he look us in the eyes and tell us that he has been prioritizing money from fossil fuel CEOs over our lives, that he has been standing with the rich instead of our futures. We are here demanding that he recognize this and that he admit this to our faces. We are here to share our stories with him as Kentuckians and as his constituents about why we support the Green New Deal and why this is the only solution for, for us. We have some pictures with us of the people we love and the things that we have to lose because of climate change. First, we have Lily Gardner, who's going to come share her story. She's a young Kentuckian, and she's going to tell us why she supports the Green New Deal. Yeah, Lily. Yeah, Lily. My name is Lily Gardner. I'm 15 years old. I grew up in McGoffin County, Kentucky, a hamlet in eastern Kentucky, deep in coal country, and now I am here representing my community. My mother doubled the Jewish population of my community when I was born. It was our claim to fame. We were curiosities with our Haggadahs lining the hallways and the matzah that we made, or the matzah ball soup that we made for every Passover. But ultimately, despite the fact that we tried to take it in stride, we knew that we were outsiders in our community missing a fundamental thread that ran through Appalachia. This fact became only more acutely clear when I began to attend the local Catholic school where all I wanted was to be able to drink the wine, eat the wafers, and be a part of their community, but instead I was on the fringes. When I was in kindergarten, a girl brought me to tears because she screamed at me, telling me that I must leave Eastern Kentucky, that I was too different for them, that I didn't belong. And while in that moment my teacher's assurances were consoling, they did nothing to mitigate the displacement that I would feel for the rest of my elementary school years. But then I visited that same girl's trailer many years later. I witnessed, I saw her family, six people living in a one-bedroom trailer, maybe 600 square feet. I saw the lack of food on the table, the generational poverty that she was suffering through. She, too, was on the fringes, much more than I was, on the fringes of our community, of our state, and of our nation, disenfranchised and ignored. Her father overdosed the next year. When I was 10... So there's a lot of testimonies. It's pretty amazing if anyone wants to look it up, but just good to see, because you normally don't see that when you, everybody always talks about red states, blue states. You're not seeing really what Fernanda's talking about of people coming and trying to talk. Obviously, they have certain talking points are hitting on fossil fuel and we're the youth and tell us to our face. But the other side is there's a lot in there as well. Ari, did you have something you want to? Yeah, just uh, in closing, speaking of testimony, can you uh, mention the uh, the bill that's that's going uh, in, in the legislature right now around sustainable development, sure. please? So uh, what we'll be having is Senate Bill 698. So on Friday, we had our 14th annual Human Rights Day at the state capitol. On a great note, uh, we had Senator Kalani English as well as Senator Carl Rhodes. They were focusing on Senate Bill 698. It's looking at making sure that all the 17 goals are then implemented here in our islands. It has third reading tomorrow in the Senate, so it'll go to the House. So the one thing we have to look at is contacting our House officials, making sure the House of Representatives knows that we support this Senate bill, and to contact them. So. You can go on to the, the testimony site on the public access room website for 
here in the state of Hawaii, and you can actually put testimony in and just load it up. Uh, one thing we do suggest is actually loading it, writing it out first, and then loading it up as a file. Because uh, sometimes when you write it in, and just when you're about to hit send, there could be a glitch in the computer and people have lost that. So if you do want to send testimony, you can also just say for or against, but it's uh, Senate Bill 698. We also have two more resolutions coming out, similar to Senate resolution that we did last year, Senate resolution number 11. And those are looking at number one is taking the Global Pact for the Environment introduced by France, which allows us to actually combine environment and human rights together and build on the Paris Agreement, which Hawaii is, of course, a party and still in, to then focus on, on what's next. So on an exciting note, uh, the Global Pact for Environment will be introduced, and as soon as we have the resolution number, we'll share that. And the other one that's been introduced is the New York Declaration on Forests. So we have two resolutions and one uh, bill. Uh, Senator Miley Shimabakura from uh, YNI, who also represents Makaha, where Makua Valley is, also introduced one since you were interested in nuclear and Marshall Islands earlier. She's introducing a resolution that doesn't have the number yet for the Nuclear Proliferation Prohibition Treaty. So the NPT that Hawaii would also sign on to that to fulfill SDG number 16. So that's some um, information on that. Uh, one thing I think that's kind of a good thing to show is I have a couple of really short videos on women and climate change, but there's a great one as well that uh, Jennifer Lawrence just did, and that really talked a lot to the points that what Fernando was talking about, about people participating in government. So it's a brand new one. It's only 12 minutes, and that still gives us enough time to talk afterwards. I'll do that, and then we'll also show the short videos on women and climate change. But... Uh, Pretty powerful one because it really breaks down the corruption in our society and how we can look at, in a way, reinvigorating democracy. We are witnessing a total political system failure in America. If you're anything like me, you may find yourself constantly overwhelmed by everything that's wrong with politics. And when I say politics, I'm not talking about Democrats or Republicans. I'm talking about the flaws that exist in our political system, regardless of which party is in power. And I know it's hard to talk about politics these days, but look, the government is ours. We pay for it, so it needs to work for us. And right now it doesn't, and I mean it really doesn't. So what's going on here? Is it Russian meddling in social media? Is it him? Is it her? No. Those two were the least popular presidential candidates since they began keeping track of such things. Only 4% of Americans have a great deal of confidence in Congress now. Just 4%. America is no longer even considered a full democracy. We are witnessing a total political system failure in America, which is the complete opposite of what our nation's founders had in mind. So I'm gonna show you three lines that show what's causing this failure, how we can fix it, and what you can do about it. So here's your first line. What I want you to do is take any issue you really care about and picture it on this line. This line comes from a Princeton University study that shows how public opinion influences the laws that Congress does or doesn't pass. They looked at 1,800 public opinion polls over a 20-year period, and we took their data and plotted it in this chart. See this horizontal line? That shows public support for a law amongst average Americans. This vertical line? That shows the likelihood of the public support leading to the passage of a law. When you plot it for the average American, you get a line that looks like this. There's your issue sitting on that line. If there is zero support for a law, there's about a 30% chance that Congress is going to pass it. And if there is 100% support for something, the most popular thing ever, there's still a 30% chance that Congress is gonna pass it. So the line is horizontal, because no matter how much support there is among average Americans, there's still a 30% chance that Congress is gonna pass that law. Princeton determined that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. How in the hell does that happen? Consider this. 
Politicians are spending up to 70% of their time raising funds for re-election after they get into office. Why? Because in order to win a seat in the Senate in some races, you would have to raise $45,000 every single day, 365 days a year for six years to raise enough money to win. Now consider that only 0.05% of Americans give more than $10,000 to politics. And then you see why politicians have become completely dependent on the 0.05% of Americans, billionaires and special interest groups, who fund their campaigns. Meanwhile, you've got lobbyists writing our laws and donating to the politicians who pass them. We have a two-party duopoly of Democrats and Republicans that makes it so that independents can't win, while the American people are leaving the major parties in droves. As you can see here, nearly half of American voters are now registered independent. And then there's gerrymandering, with politicians drawing the boundaries of their own voting districts into crazy shapes designed to prevent competition. Today, only 14% of House campaigns are actually competitive. 86% of them are not. And we wonder why young people feel that their vote doesn't matter. I've covered a lot here, but it all adds up to this vast ring of influence over our elected leaders. It's a corrupt system in which we, the people, have near zero influence over our own government. And that is sad. That is not the country I feel like I grew up in. But what's worse is that by allowing this to happen, we are causing the failure of the most important issues facing our nation. We're wasting trillions of dollars a year on fraud and abuse in our own government. One in five American children live in poverty. Our health care is the most expensive in the world. We have more people in prison per capita than Russia and China. We're losing jobs to the rest of the world. And we're not even doing enough to keep our air and our water clean for our children. America was founded on the promise of self-governance. But instead, we have statistically non-significant impact on public policy. So the question is, how do we unrig this system? I'm obsessed with this idea, not just of unrigging it, but actually fixing it. That's when I met Josh. This is it. This is the Looks issue behind you. the issues. If we fix the right. system, just plug in myself we'll there. So Sorry, guys. I just want you guys to know anything else. else. So I spoke to some of the most brilliant people in the country. Constitutional scholar Lawrence Lessig, Zephyr Teachout, and dozens of other constitutional scholars and experts and strategists. They all said the same thing. You could pass a law that would stop political bribery and fix our broken elections. And if you could do that, you could wrest power away from the corrupt establishment and put it back in the hands of the people. Here's how you fix our broken elections. End gerrymandering with independent redistricting commissions. Create ranked choice voting so third parties and independents can run and win. Implement automatic voter registration and vote from home. And here's how we can crack down on political yeah, bribery. This is really great. Overhaul lobbying and ethics laws yeah. and close the revolving door so politicians can't be bribed with high paying job offers. Mandate full transparency of political spending so we know who's trying to buy influence. Give every voter a fifty or a hundred dollar tax voucher so politicians spend time fundraising from their constituents, not just that 0.05% that I talked about earlier. If you could pass even just some of these reforms, you would undo that ring of influence and begin to reinstate we the people as the most important influence over our elected leaders. So we took all of these reforms and put them in a model law and named it the Anti-Corruption Act. And get this, 87% of Americans support making the Anti-Corruption Act the law of the land. Look at the breakdown. 91% of Democrats and 83% of Republicans. It's incredible. Now you might be thinking nine out of 10 Americans, surely Congress will pass it. But on this issue, more than any other issue, it's like asking the fox to put a lock on the hen house. Politicians won in the current system and they have an incentive not to fix it. So we need to go around Congress, in this case, by passing anti-corruption acts in cities and states all across America. Now, every time I say this, people look at me and say, how does passing city and state laws lead to fixing all of these problems with the federal government? Can I do this part? Go for it. So first of all, the US Constitution gives states sole control over how elections are run, even federal elections. So when we fix gerrymandering or election laws, that fixes the federal election in each state. That means 
that by going state by state, we have an immediate impact on how we elect Congress and how we hold them accountable. But there's more, and that brings us to our second line. This line is from a Bloomberg News study. It finds that throughout American history, passing state laws leads to federal victory. Let me show you what I mean. This chart shows the number of states over time that pass laws giving women the right to vote. When it hits the right side of the chart, that's the federal victory. Okay, now I want you to watch the blue line. We're gonna do this again with interracial marriage. There were a few states in the Northeast that made it legal decades ago, and centuries go by, and we hit this blue line where all of a sudden there's a rush of activity, which leads pretty quickly to federal passage. So here we are again with same-sex marriage. One state, Massachusetts, for many years. A couple decades later, we hit that blue line, a jump in state activity and federal passage. This isn't about these issues. This is about a winning political strategy. The crucial finding in the Bloomberg study is that a key event, often a court decision or a grassroots campaign reaching maturity, triggers a rush of state activity that ultimately leads to a change in federal law. So fixing this problem is possible, but how do we create our trigger moment for this issue? Well, the grassroots campaign from the study, that's represent us. We're bringing conservatives and progressives together to pass anti-corruption laws all across America using three strategic innovations, right-left coalitions, calling out corruption, and building a movement, a big movement. And I'm gonna break them down for you. Can I do this part? No. First, right-left. This is how people self-identify in America. This isn't party identification. This is how you feel politically. And as you can see, it's 25% liberal, 36% conservative, and 34% moderate. But for the past 40 years and the reforms I've outlined, it's liberals speaking to liberals using liberal language with liberal messengers, liberal. I just had to say that one more time. And you're just not gonna change the political power structure of America with 25% of the people. Fixing corruption requires that we enlist all Americans, liberal, conservatives, and moderates, who, as we've shown, overwhelmingly support reform. Number two, corruption. When we talk about money in politics, gerrymandering, democracy, campaign finance reform, most people just tune out. But people are fired up about corruption. And number three, we must build a movement, a big movement, comprised of all kinds of people from all across America fighting to pass anti-corruption laws and then make sure they are implemented and protected. So again, liberals and conservatives working together, corruption, and build a movement. This is the foundation of Represent Us. We believe the government should work for every American, not just a handful of billionaires and special interests, but it's not just an idea. In a few years, we've already racked up 85 wins all across the country. And if we can get those 85 wins to 850 wins, we can fix our corrupt political system, save America, and get to work on fixing everything else that's broken in our country. This is how to trigger that rush of state activity that leads to a change in federal law. And that brings us to our last line. Right now, this is you. And right now, these are all of the ways that you can help us go state by state, city by city, to fix the corruption in American politics. Volunteer and join a Represent Us chapter. Or, if that's not your thing, join the Commonwealth to make a monthly donation in support of someone who does volunteer. 100% of your money goes straight to passing these laws, not to overhead or our expenses. Every voice matters. Your voice matters. If you do nothing, nothing changes. But if we all do a little, we can win together. So the only question left is this. Will you cross that line? Join us at represent.us. Sort of longer than the most we watch, but covered a lot of things and kind of made it uh, pretty simple. So that's one new movement called Represent Us. We now have Windward. Windward, can you hear us? Is Windward able to hear? I know I see Donna there. You can hear us. That's good. So uh, one of the other aspects that is very important to us that's uh, coming up is the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous and it Issues. Activates. And then it's, it's and live right now. They should be able to hear us. Can you hear right. us, John? So the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, we can hear you. 
Mahalo, thank you for hitting the microphones and making that work. So one of the things is uh, within uh, the next month in April, it'll be the 18th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. That's a very important meeting for many people in Hawaii. And uh, we know many, you've gone many times. We're also looking at what we can do around the sustainable development goals. And also, what's also quite significant, of course, uh, this year is it's the International Year of Indigenous Languages. If you'd like to share a little bit about maybe some of the things that's going on at Windward and also in Hawaii around the UN Permanent Forum, we can definitely listen to you and hopefully hear you, and I think it'll be fine. And then we can also show one or two videos on climate change and, and women organizing around Oceania and the Pacific. Hey, Kamalihu. Can you hear me, Josh? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. So the good news is even though there's <laughs> a, the polys coming down, we can still just meet this way. All right, awesome. So aloha, everybody. My name is Donna Ann Kamehaiku Camville. I'm here a lecturer at uh, Windward Community College. I teach Hawaiian Studies. I've been going to the United Nations Permanent Forum of Indigenous Issues for nearly 12 years now. And um, usually under um, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, we were originally taken there to introduce us to the issues. Um, I think sometimes in Hawaii we get a little bit Hawaii centric and we're not really um, understanding what the broader global picture really looks like. And I think the opportunity in which to share information and actually hear stories or mo'olelo from other indigenous peoples really uh, brings you this idea of um, how collective the problems are and that it's much more global than you think. Um, here in this year's Indigenous Year of the Languages, of course, we have Amy Kalili and um, heading the committee on um, doing the work of that to bring awareness and um, to indigenous languages that continue to disappear across the globe at alarming numbers. So part of the way in which we address this is to continually um, come to the United Nations to not so much air grievances as it is to become more informed and be able to then negotiate and network with fellow indigenous peoples, the states and governments in order to reach our objectives that not only address what's happening locally um, here in Hawaii, but domestically, how to look for systemic changes, um, how to spread the education across that system, and then really get to network with what's happening on the international arena regarding, um, as you know, languages are important and we have climate change looming a ahead of us at an unprecedented rate. So it'll be interesting to see where those discussions will be had this year, um, and I'm looking forward to attending again. Excellent. I know uh, just to follow up on one of our meetings we had earlier in the semester around anniversary of the overthrow was DOSIP has agreed that they will translate from Olelo Hawaii to English, and then uh, it'll go to all of the other official languages of the UN. So DOSIP in Geneva is willing to help us at the Permit Forum this year. So one of the side events that we discussed having was, I think, looking at sustainable development and what practices are going on here in Hawaii, as well as looking at our language program as a model that other indigenous communities can look at and learn from. So I think we have two different side events that we're looking at. I think the side event registration period is open. And the exciting thing is DOSIP, based in Geneva, is willing to partner with us. So uh, be able to speak entirely in Olelo Hawaii. One of the first times Olelo Hawaii will be heard at the UN. It'll be translated into English and then into French and Spanish, uh, Chinese, Russian, and Arabic. So it's a, that'll be an exciting moment, almost second to probably the time when Hokulea was there on World Oceans Day. But I wanted to let you know yeah. that's, that's one step in the right direction of uh, building on what was discussed earlier and things that will be looked at at the Permanent Forum. That sounds exciting. I can't wait. 
I think another exciting thing with sustainable development, if, if you want to share maybe a little bit about Ahupua'a and how that is really probably the model of sustainability that has existed that we don't have to look somewhere else for answers. In fact, we just have to listen to the ancestors and know what existed prior and then be able to make sure that, of course, the voice and the wisdom of Kanakamali people is actually included into the decision-making process. Oh, awesome. Sure. So Kanakamali used a land management system that is often described as a mountain to sea management system. And not all ahupua'as can be described as being wedge-shaped, but that's the general idea in that it is a bounded geographical and topographical area that also often includes, as in this case here in Heia, from the top ridges of the mountains, it encompasses a wetland and a fish pond. It goes out into the Bay of Kaneohe and extends out to the reefs that include a whole sustainable or food development system. So when we look at the ahupua'a, it really is quite amazing. The difference, I think, between an ahupua'a and a watershed is that the ahupua'a, you had tenants of the land there who were long-lived, in other words, an ancestral connection there, and that there's a much more personal relationship, if you will, that really is based on this idea of reciprocity that is unconditional. So you are no more, no less than the tree that grows in that particular ahupua'a that produces um, things like wauke or breadfruit or kalo, for instance, which in our opinion is probably the best mass-produced food that we could probably get back into right now that would help stave in terms of food security and food production how we're going to feed people in the future. So when we talk about sustainability, it's really, really about mitigation and resilience. It's about getting ready for what's going to be the future and not something that's eventual. It's going to happen right around the corner. That's really good. And that fills in with what Fernando was saying, our guest speaker from Brazil, about place base. And that's really yes. the strength is that it's the wisdom that exists. It's the people who care the most. And I think you said it best with unconditional reciprocity. To have that really as the guiding way of how we treat one another is, is quite crucial. So that's perfect that way. I'll show one short video that we found that's only one minute. And then we have a couple of minutes still to talk together. And we're looking at April 17th as our next date. And of course, that would be right prior to the permanent forum. So we could have people who are going to the permanent forum share. We can also focus on people who are going to the Human Rights Council and the Commission on the Status of Women also share about what's going on. And it's probably one final opportunity to look before the uh, summer's over when it looks like the climate change conference, the UNFCCC, will not take place in Lima as early as we thought in November, but potentially in January. So it looks like the UN Climate Change Summit that Secretary General Antonio Guterres is sponsoring September 23rd will be the big event for the fall and what we can do here in Hawaii on all of our campuses around a climate change summit. But we'll show this one video and then make sure that anyone wants to say something short uh, before we close. Awesome. You want to come sit over here? You sure? The natural vegetation is drying up and cows have been dying. We just have to take care of a cow like we would take care of a little child. We've been trying not to let the cows walk a long distance, but instead we do walk the long distances and take care of the cows. That's why I make sure the cow gets really. The masses are really suffering. It's just sad that we don't practice anything to cause climate change, but it is hitting us so hard. All right, so that was a very good short film that looks at what's happening in Africa with the Maasai, and I know. When we go to the permanent forum, we meet many Maasai and people from around the world. And it's that impact of how indigenous peoples do the least amount to create the climate crisis, but then are in many ways directly impacted the hardest. So 
That was just one short. We have a couple others, but I know we'll run out of time. But if anyone has any final quotes, we'd like to thank everyone for participating, including Fernanda from the uh, NEF in London, and also everyone who participated at West Oahu, as well as Hilo and Windward. And we'll have another session, hopefully April 17th is when we requested, so we could have Hilo in, because uh, Hilo wasn't available on the time we had on the 15th. So we'll try to coordinate to make sure that's possible. But I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to our monthly Human Rights Sustainability Campus Community Dialogue. And as we said, next session, we'll look at what happened at the Human Rights Council, but also look ahead to what's happening at the Permanent Forum and activities over the summer that are important at the international level to us here in the islands. Awesome, Josh. Thank you. All right. Mahalo. Thank you. Good thank you. Okay. There. Aloha. Thank you. Hilo, thank you, too. And it's great to have everyone there. And we'll try to work on the Universal Periodic Review and the Voluntary National Review, Hilo, to bring you in. Mahalo. <laughs> and then it should. Okay, so now we know what to do. This is great. So this is the Human Rights Campus Sustainability. Human Rights Sustainability <coughs> Campus Community Dialogue. Awesome. Have you ever met Josh? Josh is excellent. <laughs> All right. Good feedback. Yeah. Mm. He's done a lot of work in the international arena for over 25 years. He's like been all over. So. What department is he in? Oh my God. I think he, I don't know exactly where he teaches. Sometimes he goes to HPU. He's at West Oahu. He um, might be teaching over there.